page 276. Blessed be our God, forever, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord was laid on him, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of God, the Lord, to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 22, beginning with verse 1. It's recited responsively, pausing at the asterisk. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. A 
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who, in every respect, has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may have mercy and find grace to help in need of time. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to help him, save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Congregation may be seated for the first part of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Then he took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was about to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked, are you the king of the Jews? They answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others say this about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. <clears throat> Pilate asked him, What is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted out in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Pilate came out wearing the crown, Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priest and the police saw Jesus, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate released, tried to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, 
If you released this man, you were no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. Please stand. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to a place called a place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in between. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. He also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scriptures had said. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing behind, beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And for that very hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus knew that all was now finished, and he said, In order to fulfill the scriptures, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so he put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified along with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once flowed blood and water. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occur so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture reads, they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in that place where he was crucified. In that garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there in the tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beneath the cross of Jesus, one of the familiar hymns we sing 
during Passion Tide and on this day. But the question is, how near the cross would we have been if we had been there ourselves and witnessed Jesus' crucifixion? When the uh, various gospel accounts, uh, there were some people who stood near the cross. Well, there were four Roman soldiers who were there out of a sense of duty. Uh, the Apostle John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, Salome, Jesus' uh, aunt, Mary's sister, and also Mary Magdalene. Let's consider briefly these uh, five people who stood near the cross and try to understand the place each of them took to be near the cross. We'll begin with Mary Magdalene, who took a place of redemption. Luke tells us that Mary Magdalene was a woman uh, whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. She had been in bondage for a long time to Satan. We don't know exactly what her sins were. Seven in numerology in the Bible is a complete full number, so we know that she was completely taken over and inhabited by these demons. Satan was at work in her life to cause havoc, to wreak physically, emotionally, and spiritual uh, havoc uh, within her. And she was hopeless and helpless at the same time. So then Jesus comes along and casts out those seven demons. He healed her completely. And what does she do? She became a follower of his. He delivered Mary from her bondage and set her free. Miraculously, she was saved from her dilemma and ultimately delivered uh, from her sins by this miraculous encounter with our blessed Lord. Well, for us, when a person who may be sinful or be uh, overwhelmed uh, in the bondage of sin, marvelous things can take place when we give our lives to Jesus. Like her, we can go from darkness to light, from mental, moral, spiritual darkness. Uh, we may go from the power of Satan to the power of God. And those who go from being guilty go to being free by the loving mercy and forgiveness of God through Jesus. This is what Jesus did for Mary. She was spiritually impoverished, and he filled her up with his gifts of grace. But you know what? Redemption is a costly thing. And when Jesus delivered Mary Magdalene, it cost him something too. Standing there at the cross, Mary Magdalene, okay, saw the price being paid. And Jesus had to die that we might be redeemed and brought back from our bondage as well. So Mary Magdalene stands there at the cross. The wonder that she was there at his burial too, and also at his resurrection, because she had experienced redemption, and she stood near the cross because it was a place of redemption. Salome, who was she? Most commentators identified his mother's sister as Salome, the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, perhaps. But as the mother of James and John, she was also one who asked Jesus a very selfish question. Can my two sons have a place of honor in your kingdom? In other words, she wanted something for her two sons. She wanted one of them to sit at the right hand of Jesus' throne and the other to sit at the left. What she asked of Jesus was very selfish, but she wanted the best for her two sons. And like any mother, you know what? She did what she thought was the right thing. And Jesus responds by saying that she didn't know what she was asking. Can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? In other words, referring to his death. And Solomon's request was born out of pride and selfishness. Did her two sons deserve thrones to be on Jesus' right hand and at his left? Thrones are not just given away. You have to earn them. And Solomon had forgotten the true cost of the reward. She didn't realize that suffering comes from the reward. We know now that there is no cross without, sorry, no crown without the cross. One has to come before the other. And Jesus himself did not return to the throne of heaven except by way of that holy cross. Selfishness seems to be part of the human condition. Salome's request for her two sons was yes, a proud but selfish request. She didn't realize the price that her sons would also have to pay. Remember that James, he was martyred, John was exiled before they came home to glory. As we contemplate the cross, we wonder if we too will stand rebuked because of our selfish desires. Jesus asked, are we willing to drink the cup he is about to drink? Follow that road that leads to everlasting life, even though it has to wind its way through Calvary? 
Sometimes we just say, oh, no, Lord, we just want you to answer all of our prayers, to give us whatever we ask you. Are you willing to suffer for me? Jesus asked. Oh, no, Lord, we just, we don't want the, the suffering. We just want the blessing. So when we contemplate what Jesus did for us and what he endured for us, the cross can be a place of rebuke in the light of our own selfish desires and ambitions. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was also there at the bottom of the cross, and she took a place of reward. The Gospel of Luke reveals a prophecy concerning Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul also. She heard the prophet Simeon say at the presentation of Jesus as a child in the temple. Well, how did she suffer? Well, of course, she was the mother. She suffered physically when she brought Jesus into the world. She suffered shame and rebuke. And maybe people were gossiping when here she was an unwed mother who was pregnant back in those days. She fled to Egypt to save her child. She recall after Herod uh, had uh, every young male child under two years of age killed. And she must have maybe shared some sort of sense of sadness because many children suffered and died because of that. Well, how does she feel when Jesus declared to her one day, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Yes, a sword shall pierce your own soul also. And she felt that the climax of Simeon's prophecy on the cross when her son died, and she stood there feeling the pain of the sword go right through her very soul as well. Jesus felt her sorrow. He knew her loneliness, and he rewarded her by giving her to this disciple whom he loved very dearly. What could he give Mary? Well, he gave John to Mary. The soldiers had already gambled for his clothing. Jesus didn't have any more possessions to be divided up and given away. And from that very hour, the Apostle John took Mary to his very home. Ultimately, God rewards those who suffer or have suffered for his sake. Jesus knows our trials and our needs. And just as the Bible teaches us, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. So for Mary, the Blessed Mother, to stand at the cross was also to stand at a place of reward. Now what about John, the beloved disciple? He took a place of responsibility. For John to be at the cross was to stand at a place of responsibility. What we need to first understand is that John stood at the cross restored. He, like other disciples, after the Last Supper, and when Jesus was arrested, disappeared all of a sudden into the darkness, but he reappeared and was there alongside of Jesus at the cross. Christians may stray sometimes and deny Jesus too, but there's always an open door for us to return. It doesn't matter what we've done. The cross is a place to go for forgiveness and restoration. And for John to stand at the cross was probably not the safest place to stand, or maybe the easiest. It would have taken a lot of courage and love for him to come back and stay with Jesus at the cross. But remember what John wrote years later in his first letter, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John not only restored, uh, was restored by Jesus, but also he was given a special responsibility. He said, John, you are going to take my place. I will no longer be here on earth. You must, must watch after my mother if you're going to take my place. And you are going to be a son to her also. So for John, the cross was a place of responsibility. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you, as John says in this gospel, you and I represent Jesus to others, and to acknowledge the cross is to acknowledge a place of responsibility. And finally, how about the soldiers? They stood in a place of renewal. Elie Wiesel, the uh, 20th century author and Holocaust survivor, recalls this account as he was watching as prisoners were carried away to their death in the prison camp. He writes, they were all lined up, ill-clad, some not dressed at all. They were walked just a few yards, no more, for the gas chambers were close at hand. A little child sobbed, a gypsy girl, I believe, and she hung on to her doll grimly. She had nothing else. One of the guards looked on, idly at first, uninvolved except to shout an order from time to time. Then he looked at them going in two by two into the gas chamber. A soldier tried to snatch the doll from the weeping child, but she hung on to it. And at that very moment, the guard who was watching began to change. 
the hardness of his heart softened, and the streak of cruelty within him was no longer his master. He felt only shame. What am I doing, he asked himself. What have these people done to be treated like this? It should not be so. What could he do? Rush to save them? Fight off the other guards? No, he joined the throng walking into the gas chamber. He became one of them and shared their fate. He flung his rifle to the ground, stripped off his clothes, and walked to his death with the child and her doll. When the soldier joined the queue of those making their way into the gas chamber, he walked with the child who held his hand, her other hand hanging on to her doll. The child smiled, serene and at peace. They walked on side by side, giving strength to each other. Christ walks with us hand in hand. He even bore his cross. And God stripped himself of his divinity, emptied himself, and joined the procession into our pain and our suffering. For with God, we triumph over death and over evil. Christ have, could have removed the pain in other ways, but he chose not to do so. We don't know why he did that, but he chose another way. He will walk with us hand in hand, travel the road, endure the same trials. And as we walk the way of the cross, we share the same pain and suffering that he does. Because over the hill called Calvary, we know that there is a tomb, an empty tomb, with life inside and out. The gas chamber, the little gypsy girl's tomb, have become a gateway to a better and different life. And the tragedies of this life will continue to be burdensome sometimes that we must carry. But you know what? The cross would now be lighter and the life would be one of meaning and of purpose because to follow the way of the cross leads to that place of renewal. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen.
Please rise. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Peter, our bishop, I ask your prayers for me, your priest, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, and for those to be baptized at some point after Easter. That God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people was governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all the nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for the President of the United States, for the Congress and Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, especially those suffering from the coronavirus and those who minister to their needs, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger. That God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others. That God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that they may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, especially the victims of COVID-19, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. 
O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, that things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. For those following along in the Book of Common Prayer, you may follow with the anthems which we will say with the people's response in the italics on page 200, 81. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection, for by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us, show us the light of his countenance, and come to us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Glory be to God, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood has redeemed us, save us and help us. We come to beseech thee, O Lord.
In the words our Savior taught us, we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.